those who predicted the future got it wrong. Today's nuclear power stations are based on thermal reactors, those in which neutrons from the fission process are moderated or slowed down. But these can only burn a small fraction of their uranium fuel, and they cannot efficiently burn plutonium, a byproduct of the uranium they use. In fast reactors, however, neutrons are not slowed down. They can burn the plutonium produced in thermal reactors, and as a huge bonus, they can also convert into plutonium the depleted uranium, which thermal reactors cannot burn. This is called breeding. Dunray's first task was to demonstrate that a fast breeder reactor could be built and operated safely. So, in the late 50s, a great experiment started on the rock-bound coast of northern Scotland, midway between London and the Arctic Circle. If successful, fast reactors would provide for the first time an efficient means of extracting energy from plutonium under controlled conditions. The existing network of nuclear power stations could be supplemented by electricity from fast reactors. The cost of producing electricity would thus be significantly reduced. Fast reactors would, in fact, breed more atomic fuel than they consumed. The Dunray fast reactor, DFR, was housed in a spectacular steel sphere which still dominates the site. Its 135 foot diameter, three feet greater than the Dome of St. Paul's, is the landmark by which the site is still best known today. In 1963, DFR with a core not much bigger than a dustbin, became the world's first fast reactor to produce electricity for public use. By a strange paradox, hundreds of Highland crofts, which didn't even have a piped water supply, were now lit by fast reactor electricity. A special small thermal reactor, DMTR, was built to test the behavior under irradiation of materials intended for use in existing and future reactors. Fuel for this reactor and DFR was manufactured and reprocessed on the site. There were facilities, some of them the most advanced in the world, for handling and examining experimental fuels. And extensive laboratories with comprehensive test equipment and dedicated personnel. No other nuclear energy establishment in the world was so self-supporting or better equipped to carry through a reactor development program. DFR operated for 18 years until shut down in 1977, when its role was taken over by the bigger 250 megawatt PFR. DFR had completed the task for which it was built. It had shown that a power-producing fast reactor could be designed, built, and operated safely. It had given valuable service, both as a power station and as an experimental tool of worldwide repute. It had also provided a wealth of information for the design of the next plant in the fast reactor project, the PFR. It had shared its knowledge with the Europeans, Americans, Russians, and the Japanese. There was a measure of elitism in the air at Dunray about this time. It was perhaps understandable. Willie Sinclair, a Caithness farmer's son, became a craft apprentice in 1956 and is now engineering services manager. When I started work at Dunray, it was exciting just to be part of such a new and important industry. The nuclear industry was at that time as fascinating and mysterious to the general public as space exploration became in the years that followed. Locally recruited people, such as myself, and the people who joined us from the south, atomics as they were called affectionately, we looked upon ourselves as being part of a very special technology. We felt we were way ahead of the world in fast reactor design, and as time went on, we proved the technology worked, and worked well. The 250 megawatt PFR was to be a halfway stage between the pioneering DFR and the ultimate a large commercial fast reactor with an output of at least a thousand megawatts. Construction of PFR began in 1967, with the reactor going critical in 1974. Its first electricity reached the national grid a year later. PFR was another great stride forward. The plant was designed to adequately represent the features of uh, future commercial-sized fast reactors, 
for which it had to supply statistically meaningful information. The fuel consisted of mixed uranium and plutonium oxide contained in multi-pin assemblies like this. The design of the assembly was sufficiently flexible to allow a large number of design changes during the course of the plant's life. The primary coolant was liquid sodium and the plant contained features uh, which would not normally be uh, present in a commercial plant such as the irradiated fuel cell which allowed the examination of uh, irradiated fuel and components shortly after their discharge from the reactor. In fact, most of the plant is located in one large building complex. The principal units in the power producing chain, reactor, steam generators and turbine generator set, were arranged as close together as possible. This minimized pipe and cable runs and simplified staffing during operation, thus trimming costs. The performance of the reactor, its fuel and the sodium coolant were highly satisfactory. For some years, however, the power level and load factor for electricity generation were not high. The problem was caused by minute leaks in the tube to tube plate weld on the evaporator units. This allowed small quantities of water to escape into the non-radioactive secondary sodium side. The solution to the problem was the fitting of sleeves which bypassed the weld area. In total, 3,000 sleeves were fitted over a period of 14 months. The solution was entirely successful with a very dramatic increase in the load factor. Safety is paramount and the lead comes from the top. Station manager Ed Adam is in constant contact with his operations team and regularly tours the plant to discuss safety matters or any operational concerns that may have arisen. The safety team regularly monitor the environment in the reactor hall. PFR is highly instrumented with readings recorded onto paper trace charts and into the computer. Detailed data on operating characteristics, component performance and the behaviour of fuels and reactor materials has been recorded for future reference. There are facilities for dismantling fuel assemblies, examining and testing individual fuel pins and reassembling them into rigs for further irradiation. PFR achieved its designed power output of 250 megawatts in 1985. A design then emerged for a 1,320 megawatt commercial fast reactor. The UK became involved with other European countries in a collaborative fast reactor agreement aimed at building commercial demonstration stations in France, Germany and the UK. However, the ending of the UK government's financial support for this futuristic project was just around the corner. The government reorganized the nuclear industry in 1987. In the following year, it was announced that support for fast reactor development had declined, a worldwide trend. Dunray's innovative prototype fast reactor was to be phased out by the spring of 1994, and the fast reactor fuel reprocessing facilities were to be phased out three years later. Does this signal a decline in the fortunes of Caithness and its people? Change is constant. Progressive modernization of farming methods in Caithness, as elsewhere, has boosted productivity but slashed manpower. Flagstone and slate quarrying, the main source of employment in 19th century Caithness, had collapsed, a victim of the widespread use of cheaper precast concrete paving. Overfishing had brought dearth to the North Sea, stripping the herring fleet to a fragment of its former self. In parts of the county, up to 19 children out of every 20 had no chance of earning a living in the community of their birth. The Caithness population, 44,000 in 1861, fell to 22,000 by 1953. By 1967, however, 
67% of wage earners in Thurso worked at Dunray. By 1990, many of the middle and senior management posts were held by personnel born or raised locally. Dunray offered the rehabilitation that had eluded the county for so long. The population of Thurso spiraled from 3,200 to 9,000. At its peak, with PFR entering the scene, the establishment employed 2,400 people. Half were imported key staff, including a high proportion of professional and scientific personnel. The impact of the plant was enormous. It brought massive numbers of new people to the area, people with new ideas who have contributed a great deal. The uh, local authority built uh, almost a thousand houses and the Atomic Energy Authority a similar number to cope with this influx. New hotels and new businesses were created. Now unfortunately we have the rundown of the PFR. But nevertheless the uh, Caithness Fund and Highland Opportunity have both been initiated and funded by the local authorities and I hope that those organizations will go a considerable way to stimulating a new firms and new investment within our area. As Dunray begins the decommissioning phase of its life, there are hopeful signs that the local economy will remain buoyant. Business too has benefited from the presence of Dunray. A number of businesses have been set up by people who trained at Dunray and developed their skills there and then left to go it alone. And then other businesses have grown up as subcontractors to Dunray and have then gone on and looked for business elsewhere. A very good example of that is a company called JGC Welding who did specialist welding work for Dunray but now have contracts all over the country. The shutdown of PFR brings to an end at least for the foreseeable future, the operation of fast reactor power plants in Britain. Over the last 35 years, numerous technical obstacles had to be overcome, but this was done thanks to the outstanding expertise and commitment given by everyone involved with the project. A number of major engineering tasks were undertaken, including the replacement of the superheater and reheater tube bundle units and the evaporator sleeving and the design and construction of a barrier to prevent seaweed entering and fouling the seawater cooling circuit for the turbine condenser.